The Lord is good. This morning we will begin uh, our study through the book of Hebrews. Uh, Two things you need to know up front, or we need to know up front about the book of Hebrews. First, we'll just mention that we are not sure who wrote this book. Um, uh, There are lots of names that are floated as possibilities. We just don't have a good record in Scripture of who the author is. Some say Paul wrote it. Some say Apollos. Other names are suggested. Uh, What we do know is, and what we do have great confidence in, is that this book was written with apostolic authority, which means uh, this is uh, a work commissioned by the Holy Spirit. And um, we also know that it's written in exquisite, we would say exquisite Greek, the original language. I mean, it's, it's a highly polished piece of, of thought. I mean, it's, it's so articulate in its ideas and its constructions of arguments and it's beautifully written in that way. It's of wonderful literary quality. Uh, the second thing to know is that this book was written in large part to Jewish believers. It seems that the original audience was facing a temptation to pull away from following Jesus and to kind of settle back into traditional Judaism, into temple worship. And I'm just going to go out on a limb and think that maybe we don't have a lot of Messianic Jews among us this morning who are feeling tempted to go back to the Old Testament law. Uh, If we do have any in the room today, you're in a good spot because you're going to be encouraged. But all of us as believers and followers of Jesus, we do from time to time face temptations and pressures to pull back from the faith. And the very clear message of the book of Hebrews is that we should go forward in faith. Go forward in faith. There are no less than 15, probably more, but 15 that I counted, 15 times in the book that we are called to this kind of action, to go forward in faith. And I want to break it down for you a little bit in our introduction uh, to uh, to this letter. There's power in repetition, and when things are repeated, it helps us to understand the real importance of those ideas. So in Hebrews, there are 15 exhortations to continue on in the faith. Five of those references have to do with holding on to truth. Three times we're going to read, hold fast. One time we're going to read, hold steadfastly. Another time we're going to hear, do not cast away. So these These exhortations come in the positive and in the negative, like things to do and things not to do, but hold fast to truth. There are seven references to maintaining forward motion. Do not draw back. Run. Do not drift. Do not depart. Enter in. Do not come short. Go on. All of these commands to forward motion. And then there are three references to stamina. Continue in diligence, continue in faith and patience, continue in endurance. So we get a pretty clear picture that we're to hold on to the truth, we're to endure, and we are to go forward in faith as believers. But how are we supposed to do this? Where do we get the wisdom and the strength to maintain our course in a difficult world? when we're swimming upstream against the culture that we live in, when we have a spiritual enemy who attacks us and tempts us, when we have the weakness of our own sinful flesh that's prone to these things. We just sang it. What a beautiful song to sing this morning in preparation of of this message, Come Come Thou Fount, um, that we're prone to wander. How How do we continue on and go forward in faith? Well, praise God, Hebrews doesn't leave us hanging. The author is faithful to tell us how to go forward in faith. What's the secret? It's summed up for us at the end of Hebrews 12, verse 1, and the beginning of Hebrews 12, verse 2. There's this, these two little phrases that are strung together, and I think it's the perfect articulation of the theme and the meaning of this book or message of the book. He says, Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. That's the message of Hebrews. 
We're to go forward in faith by keeping our focus on Jesus. As it says here in the New King James, looking unto Jesus. And Jesus is absolutely the central character of this book. Remember I said there's power in repetition? There are 24 references to Jesus in the first chapter alone, and it's only about 18 verses long. There are eight references in just the first four verses. In fact, we're going to spend the first 10 chapters of this book looking unto Jesus. We're going to be getting a clear picture of who the Lord is and what he's done for us and how wonderful he is and how great he is and how incredible his love and his action toward us. And that is what's going to propel us forward in faith In chapter 11, after we're done looking unto Jesus, we're going to get a whole list of examples of Old Testament saints who have come before us and how they have been faithful in going forward and following God. And then in chapters 12 and 13, we finish the book, as so many of the epistles do, with just practical instructions, practical encouragements about the nuts and bolts of walking forward and going forward in faith. So, So that's the big picture of the book of Hebrews, running the race set before us with endurance, looking unto Jesus. Now, if Hebrews, we we, we talk about the word of God as nourishment and as food. Now, if Hebrews is certainly spiritual food, if it was physical food, I think we would classify it as French food because French food is incredibly rich. That's why when you go to those fancy French restaurants and you pay an obscene amount of money for dinner, you get these tiny little portions. Those, are not, those restaurants are not popular in the South, by the way. That's not how we roll around here. But the reason you get those tiny little portions of French food is because they're so incredibly rich. And three or four bites in, you're like, wow, I don't know if I can take much more. Look, that's Hebrews. Hebrews is rich. It is dense. It is packed. And I got to tell you, I almost feel guilty trying to do a survey of the book of Hebrews. We're going to go chapters 1 through 4 today. Yeah. And and just let me tell you, all we're going to attempt to do today, I'm just going to try to describe the food a little bit. I'm going to let you know what's in each dish. And maybe you'll get just little nibbles, just little tastes, little samples. But... Listen, I encourage you, you can feast all week. I just want to give us the flow of thought so we understand how it's being laid out. And then you can go back Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and just, just, just start enjoying each meal and being fed spiritually. So massive appetizer today through the book of Hebrews. All right, let's jump into the text. Hebrews 1.1, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Hebrews is unique among the New Testament epistles or letters of the New Testament because it doesn't begin like a letter. It ends like a letter, and we'll see that later on in our study. But there's no typical greeting here, no mention of the audience or the author The writer just jumps right into the subject. But this is an eloquent and a powerful declaration of how God has revealed himself to us. In fact, people compare this opening to Hebrews along with Genesis 1.1 and John, the Gospel of John chapter 1. And here we get this incredible declaration, God, he is the subject He is worthy of our focus and attention. He is supreme and we should and should likewise be supreme in our thoughts. God, 
who at various times and in various ways. God has revealed himself to us, to people. In the past, he spoke through the prophets, Moses, David, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Elijah, Daniel, and you could build the rest of the list. But if God did not reveal himself to us, we would not know him. We would not discover him on our own. And yet he has revealed himself to us. That idea should radically impact our lives. Is there anything more critical, more important than knowing what God has said? He has in these last days spoken to us by his son. God has given us the most powerful, the most accurate, the most articulate revelation of himself by sending us his son. And it's not just that Jesus spoke God's words. It's that Jesus is God's word. He himself is the revelation of who the Father is. He said it plainly to his disciples in John 14, 9. Jesus says to Philip, He who has seen me has seen the Father. The perfect express image. Whom he has appointed heir of all things. The Father has appointed Jesus heir of all things. He is as the only begotten Son of his heavenly Father, the heir, the one with the authority to rule over all creation, through whom he also made the worlds. Jesus is in his nature completely and perfectly God. He is the creator. In Scripture, we see the act of creation attributed to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, the triune God, the three acting as one. And he is the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person. So Jesus is the complete, accurate revelation of the exact nature of the person of his Father. Listen, you can know about God from other sources. All of the prophets will tell you about God. But you can only know God in and through his son, Jesus. He is the revelation. And he is upholding all things by the word of his power. Jesus is omnipotent. He is the one who holds all things together. This describes an ongoing active effort. It is by his power that he spoke everything into existence. He said, let there be light. And it is by the word of his power that he holds all things together. It is a continuous function And human history is inevitably marching toward the conclusion that he is orchestrating. The alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end. The cause and the reason. This is our Savior. When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down. That's significant. Not only is Jesus the singular agent for the removal of our sin, but it is a work that has been completed. I don't know if you noticed this in your first job, but you don't get to sit down until the work is done. The fact that Jesus is described to us over and over again as sitting down at the right hand of the Father tells us that the work of redemption is complete. It has been finished. He himself has purged our sins. This is who Jesus is. The perfect expression of his Father, sharing in his exact nature, the heir and ruler of all creation, the creator and sustainer of all things, and the only one who has delivered us from sin. And we just got started. Verse 4 having become so much better than the angels. This is Jesus. He has become so much better than the angels as he by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. So verse four here is the conclusion of that opening statement, but it's also a transition into the next section. And so Jesus is better than the angels. Now the angels held a high place in Jewish thought. They are highly recognized, or excuse me, rightly recognized as having great power. 
They approach God in his holiness. They carry out his will. They exercise great spiritual authority. And Galatians chapter 3 and Acts chapter 7 both reference that God used angels to deliver the law to Moses on Mount Sinai. And so in Jewish thought, angels are pretty special. Angels are important, and they would, there was a tendency to revere angels. Now, by comparison, Jesus in the incarnation is fully man. And, and man, as a being, is of a lower order in creation than our angels. And yet, Jesus is still greater than the angels. Jesus is certainly greater because of his divine nature, But the author also says he has, by inheritance, obtained a more excellent name. There's a greatness and a glory that Jesus has obtained in addition to the glory that he holds simply as being God. And that's because of what he's done for us in redemption. The Jews and these Jewish believers just like we are, in danger of losing sight of what is great because of something that is good. And so the author, through these first few chapters, is going to repeatedly say, Jesus is better. Jesus is better than everything else that is, that is trying to vie for your attention. Jesus is better than even all of the good things that God has given and provided and all of the good ways in which God has spoken. And he's going to say, Jesus is better than the angels and Jesus is better than Moses and Jesus is better than the high priest in the temple. And here he starts to lay out this case about Jesus being better than the angels and he's better by nature, but he's also better according to the work that he's done, even though he became a man. He has obtained an inheritance. He has inherited the right to rule and reign over the people of God. Look at verse 5. For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. The rest of this chapter is going to be the author using Old Testament scriptures to prove the deity of Jesus. And specifically in relation to Uh, to the angels, and that he is above them and greater than them. So he begins here. And this first quote is Psalm 2, verse 7, the messianic psalm that describes how the Messiah will rule the earth with a rod of iron. And there the Messiah is referred to by God the Father as his son. You are my son, today I have gotten you. Not just a son, in a sense all of us who are in Jesus are sons and daughters of God, But he is the only begotten. The only begotten. The idea is, comes from him, is of his nature, shares in his nature. Not adopted sons and daughters by faith, but the only begotten son, perfectly like his father, of the same nature and substance of his father. You are my son, today I have begotten you. And then another quote, and and again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a father. A son, and that's a quote from 2 Samuel 7, a prophecy of the one who would come from David and rule over the nation of Israel, a reference to the sonship of the Messiah. Now Hebrews 1.6, he says, but when he, but when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. And he's just stringing together these Old Testament quotes. He says the angels worship the Messiah. They worship him. The firstborn into the world, another title for Jesus. Don't let the the term firstborn throw you off. When we talk about the firstborn, it's a title in Scripture that refers to the one who has the right to inherit authority from the father over the family. Okay, In Scripture, it's used, now that typically would be the firstborn son in the family or in in the birth order. But it's not required that a person who is the firstborn be the first one actually born in the family. And I say that just to emphasize that this is used as a title. There are lots of men in the Bible who were the firstborn who weren't the first to come uh, in the family. 
Uh, Jacob is an example. Ephraim is an example. There are many others. But, but when it says Jesus is the firstborn, it's his title as the one who inherits the right to rule over all creation. So he, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. A quote from Deuteronomy 32, verse 7. And the angels, and of the angels, he says, who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. The author goes back and says, what's the purpose of the angels? What do they do? What's their function? Well, they're, they're ministers. They're servants of the Messiah. They're servants of God. They do his will. So Jesus is better than the angels because he's not one of them. He is over them. Right? Verse 8, but to the Son, he says, and quoting again now, this is from Psalm 45, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. Catch this. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. So he's talking about the one who rules, the Messiah. And how does the scripture describe the Messiah? As God. Your throne, O God, is forever. The throne of the Messiah is forever. And he says, you have loved righteousness, verse 9, and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. The Father has anointed the Son to be the ruler. So Jesus is better than the angels because he is God and the anointed one chosen to rule. This is not a place that any angel possesses. Verse 10, And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain, and they will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will fold them up, and they will be changed, but you are the same, and your years will not fail. This is a quote of Psalm 102. Here the Messiah is referred to again as the Creator. And in the very beginning, he says, you, Lord, in the beginning, Lord in all capitals in your Bible, is Yahweh. Right? The Messiah is God the Creator. And it describes his eternal nature. That though creation will pass away, he will not. He will change it like a garment. You know, one day, all of this beautiful, and I think we have a beautiful world that we live in. But it's all going to go away. And God will create a new heavens and a new earth. We get a change of clothes, as it were, in the resurrection. We get a new body to dwell in. But you know, in the kingdom, at the end of the completion of redemption, we get a new world to live in too? Incredible. But Jesus is the one who does this, the Messiah. Verse 13, But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? The angels do not sit on the throne or sit at the throne. They are active. They are busy surrounding the throne in worship and in service. Jesus is better because he sits at the right hand of God and the angels again serve his purposes. So that's the first thing set in our minds. The absolute divinity and majesty of Jesus, that he is greater than the angels. He is God, creator, redeemer, the sovereign over all. So now what? Now chapter two. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? God also bearing witness with both signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. Since Jesus is who the scriptures declare him to be, we must respond to him. So from a Jewish perspective, if God enforced the old covenant, if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, if God was faithful to his word and he blessed like he said he would bless and he judged like he said he would judge, if that word through angels God upheld, how much more 
Will he be faithful to the word given through his son? A greater word through a greater messenger. And it describes that this gospel that we believe, the message of salvation and redemption in Jesus, it was spoken by the Lord himself. Jesus came and gave us this message himself. It was confirmed by witnesses. That's verse 3. It was also confirmed by uh, miracles done by Jesus and by the apostles. And it was confirmed by the giving of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Verse 4. So we have this word from Jesus himself. We have all of this confirmation and evidence of the truth of the gospel. Therefore, as it says in verse 1, we must give the more earnest heed. We must pay more attention. We must be more diligent and hold on to this truth, lest we drift away. And that's the reality, that it is possible for us to drift away. And here's the thing that I've learned Drifting takes no effort. Drifting takes no effort. Yesterday, Ben and I got to go paddle a little bit on, uh, on Magnolia River. It's beautiful. Um, uh, I hesitate to say that because I don't want you all to go because it's too many people. So, you, so it's not good for you, but it's good for us. <laughs> but it was beautiful, and we got to paddle. But there's a gentle current in the river. And, and, and if you stop paddling, you start drifting. That's just how it works. And it takes no effort. Or if the wind blows, you're going to drift. So, so drifting requires nothing on our part spiritually. That's the picture. If we're, just, if we're just here, if we're just present, if we're just hanging out, then it's natural for us to start drifting along in the current of the world that we live in. But because of the reality of the message and who it's come from, and what it declares, we have to hold fast to it so that we don't drift away from it. But we have to engage, we have to be active in our faith. And here's the thing, if we lose sight of who Jesus is, we begin to drift. If we begin to think of him as just like another holy man, just another preacher, just another messenger, we will have a tendency to drift. If we just see him as a good teacher and, and, a, and a, a great example, then, then we can hear his teachings and his suggestions and sort of, oh, I, I agree that that's good. But when we understand that he is God and we understand what he has done to save us, then we are compelled to obey. Then we are compelled to take action, to follow after. Looking unto Jesus. Look at verse 5. For he has not put the world, that is God the Father, for he has not put the world to come, of which we speak, in subjection to angels. But one testified in a certain place, saying, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you take care of him? That's from Psalm 8. And this is where the psalmist talks about how God perceives mankind and his purposes for man. He says, you have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and has set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. God made Adam and Eve and he said, here's the earth and it's yours and I want you to till the land and I want you to take care of the garden and I want you to manage everything and I want you to name the animals and, and, and the earth is subject to you. And he gave man authority over the earth. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not yet see all things put under him. But we see Jesus. Is man over everything? No. We are subject to the world in that we are subject to death. We are subject to its dangers. We are subject to its perils. We are not walking in the the God-given authority that was given to, to Adam and to Eve, that was relinquished in sin, and we lost some of that in a significant way. And so we don't yet see man um, with everything in subjection to him. <laughs> but I love verse 9. We don't see that, but we see Jesus. But we see Jesus. That's our hope. 
we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for us. The author recognizes man has not lived up to his calling. He has fallen in sin. But man, and man is not the crown of creation with all things subject to him, right? But we see Jesus. That's why Jesus humbled himself and became a man. This is answering in the Jewish mind, well, why is the Messiah a man? Why is he lower than, he became a man for God's purposes. So that he might recover what was lost in sin. He was made for the purpose of suffering and death that he might defeat it. He tasted death for everyone. Verse 10, for it was fitting for him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory, it is fitting for God the Father to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. This was the right way for God to bring about redemption, the fitting way that the Messiah would suffer in our place. One of my absolute favorite titles for Jesus or names for Jesus in Scripture is right here. The captain of their salvation. The idea of being the captain of, of something in, the, in, this, in this word is the one who goes first. The captain was the one who went first. Jesus is the one who went first. He went through death first. He obtained resurrection first. Every believer, when they die, they're just following in the footsteps of Jesus. And that's what gives us confidence because he died and he rose. So when we die, we will rise. He is the captain of our salvation. And it was fitting for him to endure sufferings, to be made complete or to complete the work through suffering. Verse 11, for both he who sanctifies... And those who are being sanctified are all one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will sing praise to you. The reason this is fitting is because Jesus and those who put their faith in him, they now share the same substance. They share the same experience. They're of the same uh, kind or quality. He is not ashamed to call us brethren. He's walked the path that we walk. Jesus readily identifies with us. I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will sing praise to you. I think it was Spurgeon who noted here in verse 12 that Jesus fulfilled this prophecy when he was with his disciples in the upper room and he declared to them who God was and then they sang a hymn. They sang and worshiped and praised God and they went out to the Garden of Gethsemane. But the idea here is Jesus is identifying with mankind and he is declaring the Father to them. Verse 13, and again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I and the children who God has given me. So he keeps stringing together all these Old Testament passages. These, are, these phrases are from Isaiah chapter 8. Jesus trusted his father. That's the idea there. I will put my trust in him, just as we are called to trust. Same experience. Jesus walked in trust of his father as we are called to walk in trust. And Jesus, having trusted his father, was victorious over death, bringing us to salvation. He says, here I am and those God has given me. So he ushers us into God's presence. We are his brethren. Verse 14, inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those through fear of death, who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. In Jesus, we no longer have anything to fear and no reason to be controlled by sin because of it. Verse 16 for indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation, $8 word, for the sins of the people, to, to satisfy God's requirement. That's what propitiation is. 
Jesus was the one who satisfied the Father's requirement for sin on our behalf. For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. So Jesus is greater than the angels in his nature, and then he was made lower than the angels as a man, so that he might fulfill his Father's plan of salvation. And through that plan, through suffering for sin, Jesus has become one of us. He has experienced what we experience so that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest. The job of the high priest was not just to wear fancy clothes and kill animals. The real job of the high priest was to represent the people to God and to represent God to the people. He's the link. Jesus, because of his deity and because of his humanity, is uniquely qualified to do both. He knows how to reveal the Father to us, and then he knows how to help us when we struggle because he's walked the walk that we live. When we are tempted, he understands. Now listen, God knows all things anyway because he's God. He's omniscient. But Jesus, so that he might relate to us and we might relate to him, and have confidence to come to him, became fully man. He was fully God and fully man. And he lived a human experience, the human experience. I don't know that we often think about this. Jesus knows what it's like to care for a family because he was the oldest child. He held the responsibility. Jesus knows what it's like to pay bills. Jesus knows what it's like to deal with relationships, cranky siblings. Jesus knows what it's like to work hard, to care for a parent. Jesus knows what it's like to experience injustice and hatred. But he also knows what it's like to have friends, to experience joy, to have family and community. He lived through blessings and loss and joy and life just like we do. And he did this so we would have every confidence to approach him in our time of need. So we might have confidence as he represents us to his father. That he could be a faithful high priest. Is there anything you have been hesitating to take to Jesus? Be encouraged. He understands. He knows. He sympathizes with us. Chapter 3, verse 1. Therefore, because of who Jesus is, that he is our great and faithful high priest, therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. Okay, so now let's consider him. And again, one of these great titles for the Lord, that he is the apostle and high priest of our confession. We don't often think of Jesus as an apostle, but he is the apostle. He is the sent one out of heaven to reveal the Father. Um, And he's our high priest. And he was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful in all his house. So we're shifting gears here. Jesus has been, been shown to be greater than the angels, both in his deity as the son of God, but also in his humanity and his work of redemption. All right? And so, so Jesus is greater than the angels in both of the aspects of his nature, both as God and as man. Now we're shifting, and the, and the author's going to say, okay, but Jesus also now, he's better than Moses. Better than Moses. He was faithful like Moses. Right, But he's going to be found to be greater. Now, why would the author talk about Moses? Well, again, Moses holds a very high place in the Jewish mind. Moses is the one who received the law from God and gave it to the nation. In fact, we read it in the Gospels. When the religious leaders refer to Scripture, they say, Moses said. For them to say Moses said was the same as saying God said. So so they almost equated in some ways 
God and Moses, at least the voice of Moses. And so he held this very high place in their minds. And now the author says, Jesus is greater than Moses. Don't go back to the law of Moses and think that you're going back to something that's greater than Jesus. Verse 3, for this one, speaking of Jesus, has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. Pretty straightforward, isn't it? For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. Again, Jesus is greater because of his nature. He's the author. He's the builder. And Moses indeed, verse 5, was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of the things which would be spoken of afterward, but Christ as a son. Moses was faithful as a servant, but Jesus was faithful as a son over his own house. Whose house we are if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. This is a little obscure for us because in our day and age, in our culture, we don't have servants who are part of the house typically who run things and then have sons. Well, in ancient times, if you had a large household, you might have sons who are growing up, but then you had servants who held great responsibility even to help raise the sons. But everybody understood that when the son came of age, it was the son who would inherit the right to rule everything, and he would have authority over that servant. And there was never any question about the place of the son in relationship to the servant. Everybody knew that the son was the one in real authority. And so the author is saying, okay, this is Moses and Jesus. Moses was the faithful servant, but now that the son has come, right, there's no comparison. The son is the one who rules. And he, the son has been faithful. And we are of his house if we hold, here's again that exhortation, if we hold fast, verse 6, the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. Hold fast. Listen, faith that is confession without faithfulness is not faith. It's just hot air. Faith that's just confession without faithfulness is not faith. Real faith holds fast. Real faith continues forward. Look at verse 7. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works 40 years. Therefore I was angry with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my judgment. The author is now making a comparison between the Jewish Christians and their ancestors who followed Moses. Those who followed Moses, actually all of them except two, never made it into the promised land. They did not enter into the rest of God that he had provided for them. They didn't know the fullness of his peace. They didn't know his security or his blessing or the life of God. And the author is going to show that his Christian readers are potentially in the same place. In following Jesus, they are in danger of not fully entering into the rest that God has provided. How many Christians today live a dry, miserable, spiritual experience? That's not a word of condemnation. Man, that's a word of hope. Because the author wants to give us the answer to that, to 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 a remedy for that kind of dry spiritual life. They don't know the real life that has been provided for them in Christ. They don't know the promised land. They don't know his peace, his fullness. And so the author quotes Psalm 95 here, and now for a good portion of the text, he's going to unpack. He's teaching them this Old Testament passage. He's going to unpack it. And, and encourage them to be going forward in faith and showing them the pitfalls of their fathers and how not to do the same thing, okay? Verse 12, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you 
an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. The Israelites, they had hard hearts. That's why they couldn't go into the promised land. They were full of unbelief. They didn't trust God. And their hearts got harder as they continued in their sin. Verse 13 says that sin is deceitful. You know, when we choose to go after things that God does not bless or that we should not have, it seems at first that we're getting our way, that we're getting what we want. But it's really numbing us to the truth, that experience. It's carrying us away from the Lord, and it leads to heartache and ultimately to death. And so notice the author, though, he picks up that the call in the psalm is for today. There's a present call today. And he says it's still for today. This exhortation from the psalm, it still applies right now even to believers today. Romans says the same thing. Today is the day of salvation. Our opportunity to, to behold the Lord and worship him and follow him is not forever. Salvation is a limited time opportunity. Call now. Amen? Pray now. And so today is the day. He says, he says, turn today. Don't become harder in the deceitfulness of sin. Don't keep drifting as you are. That's dangerous. Look at verse 14. He says, for we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. How many times has he said this? It's about continuing to the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who, having heard, rebelled? This is a good question. What was the condition of those people who rebelled against God and hardened their hearts? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt, led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry 40 years? Remember they went 40 laps around the desert or 40 years in the desert because God said that generation was going to pass and their children would enter into the promised land? He says, was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see they could not enter in because of unbelief. Who fell? All who came out of Egypt. In other words, all those who had experienced God's deliverance from Egypt. That's amazing. They, all of them, had a revelation of who God is, and they all had an incredible spiritual experience. And yet only two of them, Joshua and Caleb, would end up going into the promised land. So it wasn't a lack of knowledge. It wasn't a lack of God's faithfulness. It wasn't a lack of spiritual experience and reality of who God is in their life. That's not what caused them to stumble and to fall. He says they could not enter in because of unbelief. That's astounding. Unbelief. Listen, unbelief is not doubt or wrestling with truth. We all, every believer, experiences and encounters some measure of doubt in their walk of faith. Doubt is not unbelief. Unbelief is the unwillingness to believe. It is the decision not to believe and to oppose God. That's unbelief. That's looking at all the evidence, weighing the experience, seeing who God is, and saying, I don't want to go that way. It's not worth it to me, and I'm going to stay here, or I'm going to go that direction, but I'm not following. That's unbelief. They could not enter in because unbelief. It was an act of their will. Look at verse 4, or chapter 4, rather, as we, as we finish. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For, he who, for we who have believed do enter that rest. So we're in the same place. We've heard the truth. We have seen, as it were, the Lord. We have the experience and the knowledge. What we need to do is respond to that in faith. 
But did you catch verse 3? We who have believed do enter that rest. How wonderful is that? We who do believe do enter that rest. Let me emphasize that the author speaks of faith. It is not we who work harder do enter the rest of God. We who pray longer do enter the rest of... That's not what he says. We who have believed do enter that rest. Now, Jesus says in John 10.10, I have come that you may have life and life more abundantly. The author is writing to New Testament Christians and he's saying there remains yet a rest for the people of God. It is the rest that we have in Jesus. It is the abundant life. See, Joshua is a picture of that in the Old Testament. Joshua, Hebrew, Jesus, Greek, same name. Joshua is the one who led them into the promised land, into the rest of God. Who is it that leads us into rest? It's Jesus. Right? There remains a rest for the people of God. Now, he continues on. Let's pick up in verse 3. For he who have, we who have believed do enter that rest. As he has said, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. I think the emphasis there is it's his rest. Jesus says, it's my rest. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. God has provided rest. And the work of God providing rest is something that is already finished and accomplished. Rest is available. It's not something we're looking forward to in the future. It's something available in the present. And the author says, the works to bring about rest were finished from the foundation of the world. That is, before God created the world, he had already determined the plan of redemption, and therefore it was already done, or as good as done. It could not possibly fail because it was God's plan. So everything that we need for rest has been accomplished already. We don't need God to do anything else for us in order for us to live in his life and peace. Don't believe the lie that says, hey, well, as soon as the Lord fixes this in your life, then you can have rest. Then you can have joy. Then you can be at peace. Then you can know him and be one of those happy Christians. Just waiting for this thing to get resolved and then I can know the rest of God. No, it has been accomplished from the foundation of the world. It is there. It is available. We simply need to enter into it by faith. Look at verse 4. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this place, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience, again he designates a certain day, saying in David, one of the Psalms, today, after such a long time, it has been said, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. So I'm just going to walk you through his logic very fast. He quotes from Genesis 2, God rested on the seventh day, the prophetic picture of rest in the Messiah. And, and, and so... God has provided a place or a state of rest. And then in Psalm 95, he says, Israel didn't enter my rest in the promised land. But then he also says, but today we should enter his rest, which means after that whole promised land experience, rest is still possible and we're called to it. God's rest was not ultimately physical in, the, in Canaan, right? It's spiritual. And it's not brought to us through Joshua it's brought to us in Jesus. And all these pictures of rest speak to how we rest in the salvation that God has provided. Verse 10, For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. 
Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. He who has entered God's rest has himself also ceased from his own works. This is so important to these Jewish believers. Don't think, Jewish believer, that you're going to go back to the law and back to the temple worship and back to the sacrifices and back to eating Hebrew national hot dogs and being kosher. Don't think that you're going to go back to that highly regulated religious lifestyle and form of worship and think that you're going to find rest. Because in rest, we have ceased from work. You're no longer working at keeping the law in order to make yourself righteous. You are resting in the work of Jesus who has made you righteous. This is really important. Point of clarification. As believers, we are still called to do good works. We are still called to work. But there's an incredible difference. Because our works and our obedience are from salvation, not to salvation. That's what's important. Everybody wants to, to jump on the, not everybody, a common criticism of the gospel of grace is that it produces lazy Christians who think that obedience is not part of the gospel. It is. Obedience is evidence that you actually were saved. If there's no obedience in following Jesus, we don't know if it was real. A confession that isn't also um, faithfulness is just hot air, right? It's meaningless. But when we see good works, we know that is the expression of genuine faith, that you're resting in Jesus. And so that's really important for us to understand. But you're not going to work your way to God through the law. You have to rest in what Jesus has completed. You have to enter that rest by faith. And this is not just a Jewish thing. There are plenty of Christian, put it in quotes, there are plenty of Christian-like religions and religious systems full of regulations and obediences that people live by in order to stay in the supposedly the good grace of God. But you can't work your way into grace. That's why it's called grace. It is a gift. And we rest in what Jesus has done because he did the work. The Lamb of God, Revelation says, was slain before the foundation of the world. It's already been completed. And we rest in it. Verse 12. Now, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from its sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. The author has just used Psalm 95 to pierce into the heart of his readers, to show them their need to enter into God's rest. And now what holds a person up from doing that is not bad circumstances and not uncertainty and not lack of revelation, but what holds a person back is willful unbelief. And the word of God reaches in and pierces in there and says, this is the issue. And it separates, and this is so practical for us because how many times are we confused about ourselves? We're angry, we're upset, we, we, have, we don't know how to process something, we're, we feel stuck spiritually, we don't know what the issue is. And, and, and it's like, well, how do, we, how do we get clarity? How do we figure out the right way to respond? We seek God through his word because it is living and active and powerful. We go to the surgeon of the word and the word reaches into the heart and says, okay, this is your soul, this is your thought, this is your attitude, this is you, and then this over here, this is the Lord, and this is his spirit, and this is where he's calling, and this is what he's leading. And then we see clearly, and then we can respond and say, okay, now I can forsake these things, and I can follow the Lord. And the word of God brings clarity to us. 
And that's what he's just done by teaching them Psalm 95. says, this is what speaks to you, Hebrews, and to your experience. This is why we as a church do our best to faithfully go through God's word because it is living and powerful and active. It's how God speaks to us and reveals, and it's, it's by his word that we know how to grow and obey. And so he's exhorting them to hear God's word, to let it speak, and then to respond. Verse 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. There it is again. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us there come, therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. When God speaks through his word in powerful clarity to our hearts and shows us the way forward, don't stop there. Hebrews, don't stop there. Brothers and sisters, believers, don't stop there. No, come boldly to the throne of grace. Don't have all the answers, but never apply them. Don't know all of God's commands, but never surrender to them. No, let the word of God speak to your heart and then come boldly to Jesus. Come boldly to the throne of grace. We have a high priest who has passed through the heavens. <laughs> He's made the journey. He's the captain of our salvation. He came to earth and became a man. And then, right, death, resurrection, ascension, back to the throne. He has passed through the heavens. He has made the journey. He was like us. He sympathizes with our weaknesses. Therefore, we can come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. What does it mean to come boldly to the throne of grace? Boldness is not arrogance, but boldness is confident expectation. Boldness. Boldness. There are all sorts of things that we do in life with boldness, and we don't even think about it. If you go to our back table, there's a few left back there. There are many bottles of water. And you have faith that the water is good. Because I've never seen anybody go take a bottle of water and pull the cap off and sniff it. <laughs> no, we're thirsty. We come boldly to the bottle. We take the cap off and we slug it confident in our expectation of what we're going to receive. We do this in all areas of life. We come boldly. Well, we should come with that same kind of boldness to Jesus because we are confident of his love for us, his power, and his work, and that he will give grace to help in time of need. Looking unto Jesus the author and the finisher of our faith. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the goodness of your word, the wisdom of your word. Father, we have sampled so much today. But Father, may all of these things clear the, sort of clear the mist from our eyes. Clear the fog from our minds. Lord, that we would have a clear, unobstructed view of who Jesus is and of what he has done for us. And then we would move forward in faith, taking steps of obedience and receive mercy and receive grace and be cleansed and be strengthened and be healed. Lord, I pray that you would meet your people today. Everyone in the room, Lord, help us. Lord, we come boldly to your throne knowing, Lord, that you willingly give help. You willingly forgive. You willingly restore. You show us mercy out of your love. Our faithful high priest, we worship you today. Lord, we receive from you, Lord, your word. In Jesus' name.
Amen. You're free to feast on this all week. Have a blessed time. We will see you Wednesday night. You're dismissed.